Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achins. On my journey to try and understand how the Chinese think a little further, I have with me Lieutenant General Nasiman, who is an authority in India as far as the study of China is concerned. Today, my question that I'm going to ask him is that why does China think it's always right? Why does China think, especially in the case of India, that it should be consulted? Or it should have a say in what India wants to do with itself. Who should India's friends be, and how should India deal with various different issues around the world? First of all, sir, hello and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming in to Dev Talks for the second time, sir. Thank you, thank you, Adi. It's a, it's always a pleasure to be on the show, and thanks for inviting me. It's a privilege. Sir, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned last time, and you just spoke about it offline as well. The concept of Tanzania. Uh, just for the benefit of viewers, Tianzia, let's kind of uh, you know build on it a little bit. Let's make them understand a little bit for the people that are going to be watching the show for the first time, so that they get a little hint of what we are talking about. And I urge the viewers, if you're watching this show for the first time, please go back and see the first show, so that you get a little bit of a context. So, just a short introduction on this particular concept, and uh, let's move forward, sir. Yeah, Tianxia is a concept where you know, Tianxia is you know all under the heaven. Tian is heaven and Xia is under the heaven. So all under the heaven is the is the the concept, and they feel that the the old emperor of China actually is a descendant from heaven. So therefore, he is mandated to rule the world. So that is the Tianxia concept, and the Tianxia actually is pervasive. Like for example, it gives the Chinese a little superior aura. It gives the uh, Chinese to think that they are actually superior to people, and things like that. So, again, last in the last interview, I had explained this, and they all said, thought till very late in history, that they, the world is flat, China is in the center, and the others are around it. So this this concept of Tianxia, one is the emperor descending from the heaven. Second one, the world is around. China and China is in the center gives them this feeling of say Tianxia and a feeling of superiority over others. So when they deal with people, when they deal with at least people who are either equal or weaker, this phenomenon is very very predominant in the, in the behavior. So this is something which we need to understand. And in many of the in many of the uh, instances, particularly during the uh, during the uh, century of humiliation, that is, uh, and beyond. In that, when the Western powers wanted to come and meet the meet the emperor, Chinese emperor, most of the talk was on you know on on the on the format of it, not on the content, but on the format and the things. Who will pay obeisance to whom? What kind of tributes will be given to whom? That kind of a thing. So, you invariably find. This kind of a behavior actually manifesting in the interactions that the Chinese do. So this is the Tianxia concept that we need to understand. They also feel if something is good for them, it should be good for others. <clears throat> like for example, <coughs> pardon me. In my interactions when I was posted in China, it used to be clearly conveyed by people who are interlocutors of ours in the Chinese uh, on the Chinese side that you know if it is. It is good for some country, like for example, maybe a very small country in Africa or a very small country in in our region. It should be good for us, good good for India. So that is the kind of behavior and that is the kind of feeling you will get when you deal with them. And if you can factor this in your dealings, I am sure you will be able to do a better job of actually interacting. So, but why is it that this particular? Uh, uh... I won't call it understanding, but this particular base is there within the Chinese in terms of their dealings with the outside world. Uh, one can understand a certain cultural, civilizational aspect of it, but in today's day and age, if one is stuck in uh, the past, what is the difference between a Chinese thought process and probably a jihadi thought process? Uh, Apart from I the think... violent part of it. That that is that yeah that is a little extreme extreme way of comparing jihad with this kind of a behavior. I don't think we should go there, but the fact remains. 
Chinese, again, I mentioned in the last interview, Chinese draw a lot of lessons from their history. And they try to apply it even today. That's why I mentioned last time that, you know, you need to look at what the Chinese have been doing in the past, what are they doing in the present, and then you can probably look into the future. That is a better way of understanding and studying China than to be episodic of what is happening now and then trying to extrapolate. Hmm. So this, this I explained to you. And similarly, yes, they draw a lot of lessons from the history. So when they, when they taught these things in, in diplomacy and everything else, you find a lot of lessons from the past are actually taught to them even today. Like I also explained to you, even the NDU, National Defense University in China, the senior military officers are taught the successful dynasties, what they followed during their period, is something that is being taught to them even today. So therefore, there's a continuity of thought process. So that is where it, it gets explained as to why that behavior is there even today. So that is the answer to your question. That's interesting. <laughs> Sir, when they deal with India, I mean, it is always... Uh, for example, the cartographic part of it, they, they bring about these maps and they bring about this entire thing. Uh, so do we. And I'm, I'm of the firm belief that we also, uh, you know, come up with the maps and letters and correspondence and this and that. But it is never accepted by the Chinese. Uh, is this because they think whatever they have done and their maps are correct and the rest of the world is not aware of the situation? Is that the main crux point of the challenge between the border? Mm, I would say that is not the correct uh, way of putting it across. I'll tell you, if you need to go, for the, to understand this, again, you need to go back to the period between, say, 49 and about 57 or so. 1949 to 1957, when both these countries became independent. I mean, one became a People's Republic of China and the other one became a Republic of India. See, what had happened was that, you know, even the initial stages, there were some kind of lack of understanding on the border from both the sides. So when in 1954, when we signed that uh, treaty for trade with Tibet, we found that we have already accepted Tibet autonomous region as part of China in that agreement. And then we identified six passes in the, in, in the middle sector and various other sectors as to how to, those will be the passes that will be uh, that will be actually used for trading between both the sides. Willingly, India thought that you know this will probably fix the boundary along those six passes. But later on, if you look at the intrusion that started taking place in 1954 in Barahoti, you find that you know Chinese were not actually saying this or meaning this when they wrote that treaty. So there is a bit of an assumption here, saying that probably since we have done this of fixing these six passes for the trade to take place between India and Tibet, we understood that you know it, it was the boundary. But then the Chinese said, said, no, this is not the boundary, but this is only for the passes which have been allocated for the trade. So one is that kind of an understanding. Second, when we started writing to the Chinese regarding the boundary, like, you know, they didn't accept the McMahon line, as, as we all know. In 1914, when we signed that agreement, the Chinese representative did not sign the final final map that was fixed fixing the boundary, and they actually uh, disowning. I mean, they started disowning that thing, and they said that we don't recognize the McMahon line. When we started writing to them on the on the on the boundary issue, and also the, some of the maps in China showed Dakshai Chin and other other places part of India, their response was that the, these were the old Kuomintang maps. The new government did not have the time to go through these maps. And as and when we get across to this, we will try and fix these issues is what the answer one got. Later on, around say 59 onwards, you find a shift in the Chinese position, which said that you know the India and China's boundary was never, never demarcated on ground. And even with reference to Bhutan and other things, we need to get in touch with those countries to resolve this boundary issue. So there has been a shifting kind of a position on the boundary issue by the Chinese over a period of time. That again tells us that I think probably they were right in saying that they didn't have the time to look at the initial stages. But as time passed by, they realized that, you know, 
they need to probably get into a better position on the border. So therefore, they started shifting their positions. And particularly the position started hardening on both the sides after that Western Highway started mm. getting recognized by, by, by us. Like, not recognized, was, was known to us in 57. And when we went, sent the patrols, then we came to know that this road is existing within the XI chain, which is the part of Indian territory. And therefore, thereafter, the issues started uh, going a little downhill in the relationship between India and China. So there has been one is on the shifting positions. That is one that we need to understand. Second, having built this road, they needed further depth to the west. There is no way that they could have left this road undefended. So they needed to come further west. And so they came and then the claim line of, say, their so-called 59 claim line, which we don't yeah. recognize. We haven't, we don't recognize the 59 claim line. And then they came up to the 62 war and then that line came up. So the whole issue is, to, your, to answer to your question, they think that what they are doing for their benefit or for their country's benefit is right from their point of view. So therefore, they'll put across anything and say, like, for example, even yesterday, our foreign minister has been saying, Chinese are actually conflating what we are looking at in the present situation of actually coming to an understanding of maintaining peace and tranquility along the line of actual control with resolution of the boundary. <coughs> this I've also faced in many of the track 1.5 and track 2 dialogues I have been having with the Chinese, wherein, you know, we, we have been at pains to explain that these two are entirely different. What we are looking at is a far less kind of a kind of a thing than the solution of the boundary question fully for advancing the other issues, issues on the bilateral relationship. But they actually conflate this. So this is something which they feel that whatever is good for them is the correct thing for them to project. So this is again another thing that we need to be keeping in mind whenever we interact with them. So is today's narrative about min saying that everything seems to be hunky-dory within the border right now, there's no problem there, everything is okay, uh, we should move forward and do other things, talk about other things in the bilateral relationship. Is this also a part of that style of understanding, sir? I agree. They, they, they tend to feel that you know what is good for them is what is right. So therefore, you, you have to deal with them keeping this thing in mind. And so therefore, not only here, in many of the other things also, they start conflating too many things, actually. In fact, when we when we discuss these things with them, it actually is, um, we are saying what we exactly feel and in simple language so that, you know, there's no ambiguity. But I think it gets past that. The problem that I see of it, and I'm talking from the Chinese side, sir, that you are going to be for the lack of a better term, arrogant in time, in terms of projecting your understanding over the other. And you're not doing it with one, you're doing it with pretty much everyone. Somewhere down the line, some guy's got to put his hand up and say, yeah, what are we doing? Or is that never going to happen? Uh, you're, you're asking on the Chinese side, somebody will put up their hand? From the Chinese, I'm, uh, that's what I said. So I, if I look at it, this particular situation, let's say I'm a Chinese guy. Uh, probably in the strategic community and I look at all the countries and I'm trying to impose my will on every country around me. Doesn't anybody stand up and say, hey, listen, I don't think this is going in our favor. We've got so many enemies now. What's happening here? Uh, okay. Let me tackle this question. It's a very interesting question, actually speaking. You see, we must understand the way the um, the system of communism functions. I'm not only saying in China, it's also in other countries where communism is prevalent, like DPRK. In fact, when I was in China, I was also simultaneously accredited to DPRK, Northern North Korea. Oh. So I've been to North Korea a number of times. You see this trend of, you know, Russia and everywhere else. You see, the Chinese way, I mean, the communist way of doing things is that whatever the communist party thinks at the top, is the same party line that should go down to the last man on ground. This is something which is a very unique phenomenon in these countries. And you find that they will all speak the same language. And if you travel to 
China and many other places, many of these communist countries, you will find on the road corners there will be boards put wherein the newspaper is pasted every day. So a common man goes and reads that particular thing. So whatever the official paper, like for example, People's Daily, China Daily, Xinhua, these things are actually the government's version of, they are the ones which put up the government version. So you will find these pasted in, in many of the places. Like, you know, there's a notice board kind of a thing where the newspaper mm -hmm. gets pasted and people go and read it. So whatever they see on the top, is what the last man will think. That is the way the system functions. So if you don't understand that, then you will find that you will expect some kind of a variation from what has been taught or what has been told with the person whom we are talking to or negotiating and you will find no difference. So that is where you get surprised. Yeah. So even in official meetings, they do not de deviate from whatever has been the written script. We also have a written script when we go for official meetings unless it is an informal informal summit or informal meeting. So we speak our agenda, they speak our agenda. They don't deviate even for, for a single word. They typically read from the script that has been given to them. So the system is set in such a manner that whatever the top person thinks is the one with the bottom person also will understand. So that is a system that we need to understand when we deal with China. So there's no sense of logic or anything other, just the word. There may be sense of logic, there may be discussion, there may be internal issues, but I don't think, like, I think I mentioned to you either here and some other interview I had mentioned this, that, you know, it is not that Communist Party is homogeneous. There are, there are yeah. differences of opinion within the party itself, but all this gets, gets discussed in the four walls of Chungnan High in Beijing, where all the leaders reside and work. You know, it's close to Tiananmen Square, there is a place called Chungnan High which is actually the, uh, the, the, it's a compound, it's a compounded area where, where actually all the leaders live and work. And a lot of discussions do take place, but the only thing is, unlike our noisy democracy, when everything and mm -hmm. anybody can voice an opinion, there, the, the, all these discussions, difference of opinion, everything is discussed, thrashed out. And once something is put out, nobody questions that there are. So it looks but like it a very... Not that there are, there, there are no difference of opinion there. Like, for example, during COVID, you found at least 10 to 12 articles which came up from different people questioning that zero COVID policy and questioning Mr. Xi Jinping's policy, etc. They were allowed to be online for some time. It is not that, you know, they were immediately removed. Like in many cases, it gets remo immediately removed. So that also gives an indication that China is trying to project an image that they are a democracy and where people's difference of opinion can be heard. Even if you look at the uh, China... Uh, Russia joint, uh, joint, uh, I would say the um, press release that came up after Mr. Putin's visit on 4th of February last year, before the uh, Russia Ukraine campaign started on 22nd. You find there are two paragraphs which say that, you know, they are democ Russia and China are democracies. And they explain as to what, how, how they are saying that. So there is a tendency to project themselves that there is a democracy functioning within China, which we may or may not accept. That's a different issue. But from their side, they are saying that, you know, there is a democracy within China. And for example, there are also eight non-communist non parties in China operating. But whether they are having a different view or otherwise, that, that is debatable. But there are eight non-communist parties working in China. So... <laughs> You find in all ways they try to project that there is a democracy within that system. However, you find that ultimately it is the party that is under control and the party's uh, regime is supreme and all their thoughts and actions that is, is actually comes, coming out. So that so is the way when, to understand this particular issue what you mentioned. Sir, I mean this is very insightful actually because you know It'll actually tell me how to read a lot of official statements from now on. Because you got to believe the factor that what he's writing is not fake. He actually believes what he's saying. You know, uh, and this is something very interesting to me because when we see uh, statements being given in, in, in public domains, for example, the recent Sangrila dialogue or, you know, Chingang's uh, statement before uh, uh, Anthony Blinken landed in and he... 
I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but Chingang literally said that America should not dream that he can change anything. You know, it was a very cordial sort of a visit, but this is what was said before uh, Mr. Blinken landed down, and he said, "There's no, not going to be any change. That's it. We are who we are, and we're going to remain who we are, and our goals are the same." So now, even yesterday, even yesterday, when you look at that statement which came from the Chinese as well as the U.S. side. so you find certain subtle variations on cooperation etc and you also find that you know this polite kind of statement which came out yesterday but beyond that we have to wait and see as to whether there is any real progress so so when uh, the chinese project themselves across the world i mean when when they are called to speak and they are told to project and when they project themselves across the world the understanding on their aspect is that everybody should believe what we are saying as the gospel truth now what happens to that particular game when they are called out in public that is where the problem comes you see um last 3 uh, years or so the i would say starting from actually mr trump's regime in the yeah. us around 2017 onwards when they when they when they actually said that china and russia are revisionist powers in their national defense strategy and security strategy which came out during that time onwards you find uh, the uh, the reaction to that has been pretty strong from the chinese wherever they are posted the chinese ambassador i mean that's what is known as the wolf warrior uh, diplomacy mm. that 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 has been seen in the last 4 to 5 years but you will also see there is a moderation of late you don't find that kind of wolf or your kind of a thing you know that time around when particularly when all the countries were blaming china for covid as as the origin of covid for the origin of covid they were really going you know uh, ballistic in the in their even to the host country they were not polite they were very 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 offensive so that kind of a behavior was not seen much earlier <coughs> it started around 4 to 5 years ago <laughs> sorry but you also find in the last about 2 to 3 years <coughs> when china set out its goals for 2035 one of the goals says that you know they want to become a soft power super power by 2035 <laughs> okay and xi jinping is on mr xi jinping is on record saying that his diplomat should go out and ch- sell the china story well and make china likable so you find there is a dual approach here wherever their core interests etc are affected you will find a wolf or your kind of behavior on the other side you will also find a soft power projection taking place simultaneously so this is a trend that we may be seeing in the near future at least till the near future <coughs> sorry so how do you so, think this will change the perspective of uh, their outlook sir i mean their outlook is in uh, their outlook may or may not change their outlook is simple today they feel that they have arrived on the scene and they are something to reckon with for others and they are almost in the number 2 position with with us and all they need to do now is to reach the position of number 1 over a period of time that is clearly understood if that is that is the, that is the premise because it is all says in the second centenary goal of 2049 they say that you know we should be an important power in the world and they also talked about g2 they also talked about major power diplomacy when mr xi jinping went to us in 2014 <coughs> so there has been a continuous process of reaching that position at some point in time so they understand that you know we are now in a position economically we are far stronger and better we are actually building up our military 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 muscle we are also increasing our influence in various international systems and everything else like recently you would have seen the communications chief of aib resigning the canadian he resigned from aib saying that it is not benefiting my country so there are issues which which make the chinese feel that okay we have arrived on the scene so therefore there is a particular behavioral pattern which you can see that is something that we have to uh, be familiar with 
and we need to be prepared to face it whenever we deal with with, with the chinese having That's said that hmm. having said that let me let give me 30 seconds then and i'll come back please to the question sir. again please sir having said that they also keep saying in many of their writings that you know we need to we are still you know behind uh, in military power and other powers and so we need to build up and those things are also on on the side on the side so you find while they feel that they have arrived they feel they are not yet there so there is a there is a there is a bit of a dichotomy there but they are working towards reaching the number one position in the entire world so if that is the case it gives them the feeling that they are superior to far other uh, far superior to others and so therefore that shows in the behavioral pattern of their their uh, behavioral pattern with those countries Now that that's insightful, sir. Honestly, I mean, the, it, it's 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 such an interesting game because they that tells me that there is an innate understanding that listen, we probably have to change our tact a little bit. So the arrogance factor is not really working towards their benefit; is actually going against it, uh, which is very very interesting to me, sir. When you know, I have two small questions to just round up this wonderful talk. Is that Uh, of course the last one will ov- obviously going to be about india but when you look at a chinese leader when they when they when they interacting with the world today they are not on the as a uh, front foot as they would have been i mean xi jinping used to be all around the world talking to this talking to that he is now restricted to a certain set of countries with minimalistic <clears throat> interactions with the west and literally very little interaction within his neighborhood so that's that's an i won't call it an isolation is probably going a little too far but somewhat of a left alone sort of a game now here is a country who likes to impose itself and to state what they're saying is right being brought into this sort of a situation how do they perceive uh, this change in the position sir you see uh... what i think we are missing is mr xi jinping has not been traveling much that is visible yeah. because ever since covid started his travels have actually reduced quite a bit but please look at mr wang yi's travels he is actually been traveling you know like non stop i would say yes mm. i really wonder whether he sleeps in the same bed or sleeps at the same town or city for the second night so he has been actually you know in like a blizzard he has been going and visiting many of the countries i think we should not underestimate the uh, chinese reticence a little bit because of covid because mr wang yi has been actually been traveling like you know he has been very busy let me tell you that and i think the message from mr xi jinping he carries and conveys to people which which is happens in many of the countries even in our country it will happen with if mr jayshank can travel somewhere i am sure he is carrying the message from the pm to 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 convey so that would happen so we should not underestimate uh, mr xi jinping's travels reducing because of covid or anything else with uh, with uh, little less of attention towards mm-hmm. this if at all any i i don't know whether i mentioned it in the last interview but let me let me say it here we say that the chinese have not been interacting so much like you said but please look at 2020 okay they came up with the global initiative on data security so in 2021 they came up with global data a global development initiative in 2022 they came with the global security initiative and on 16th of march this year they have come with the global civilization initiative and in all this there is some gaining of momentum so you i would i would probably suggest that don't look at only what mr xi jinping is doing outwardly or anything else or any of his diplomats are doing i would say please also look at the initiative that they are launching every year around the month of may other than global initiative data security that was launched in september that is actually one month after the clean network program of the us that they launched it other than that most of these initiatives have come up around march april so you find 
Chinese are trying to give an initiative per year, and all these are going to get intermeshed into one particular objective. That they are they are actually clearly saying in the concept paper that you know the present structure that is existing is not actually a good one for the Chinese, and they need to probably look for a better one. So this is don't underestimate because Mr. Xi Jinping has been traveling less or more, but their initiatives are actually being pushed. So you find that, you know, this is a dichotomy that you'll have to live with. And lastly, sir, of course, with India today, they, I mean, they've, they've, they've kind of, I mean, officially not, but they've kind of upgraded India's threat because they now consider India to be the second biggest threat uh, after the US and not Japan anymore. And that's something that I've been seeing in a couple of writings here and there. Uh, when we, they expect India to kind of comply and they expect, geopolitically speaking, they expect India to side by the opposition to the West. And that's something which is, of course, very clearly written in Global Times that, you know, India must stand by the Russia-China game to oppose the US hegemony and uh, the US dollar and this and that. When they see India going off and doing a defense deal, when they see India going off and doing its own thing within within the world, and especially in a lot of the times it is against Chinese national interests, what do they interpret with this game, sir? Because for them, it's one way. How do they see this flip-flop that India keeps doing? And I'm meaning flip-flop in the most respectable way. Uh, we, we, we go this way and that way before I get a whole lot of trolling. Uh, we go this way and that way because of a very structured plan. How do they interpret India's moves? You see, they. In, in, I'm sure you must be reading Chinese writing like I do. Uh, they always question your strategic autonomy. Sir. They feel that you know India is going close to US and the West and in order to contain China is what the feeling that the Chinese Indeed. writings give you. right? Hmm. But off late also they have realized that both in terms of you know, when they started this One Belt, One Road initiative and then they said India should join. We didn't. Because of our concerns on the territorial integrity and sovereignty, because of the opaqueness of the uh, of the way that that uh, initiative was rolled out and even though it was told, told to us it is a multilateral but all the agreements signed were all bilateral, there were many issues. And all the projects that started pre prior to say this uh, one Belt, One Road initiative being announced were also included as part of One Belt, One Road. So therefore, many objections were there and we didn't join. There is one thing that gave them the feeling that India will take decisions based on its own interests. Second is, we were under tremendous pressure to support the US and the European Union in the Russia-Ukraine issue. We didn't do that. That gave them the second uh, second uh, proof or second uh, feeling that, you know, India again looks at its own interests and it doesn't just go to anybody whom it feels like. The other thing that, that I get to see in some of the writing, is not many writings, but few of them, which tells us that, you know, you have opened up, China has opened up too many fronts, so you need to probably develop some kind of relationship with, mend your relationship with a couple of countries and one is Japan, the other one is India. India. So you get to see such kind of writings also in the in the, in the Chinese thing. So basic thing is they question your strategic autonomy. So they feel that though India keeps saying strategic autonomy, but it keeps going closer to US is the feeling that they have. So therefore, in again, like in many of the track 1.5 and track 2, in fact, in the last couple of months, there were two of them. We feel that, you know, they keep conveying this, that, you know, you are going too close to US, you are, you are Strategic autonomy is questionable and things like that. So basic thing is they seem to have a basic doubt in their mind that even though we keep saying strategic autonomy, we keep going closer towards the US. So we 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 take a lot of pains to explain to them like, look, India-US relationship is not anything that started yesterday. Please go back and look at two decades. And then you will realize that it started improving from the year 2005 onwards when we signed that defense cooperation agreement with the US and slowly and steadily it has been increasing <clears throat> and we've also been diversifying on the military field. 
like we imported <coughs> USS Trenton, which is now INS Jalashwa. We imported a lot of the C-17s and C-130s. We imported many other things, actually speaking. And then that is something which is happening over a period of time. And it is basically to build ourselves up. That is what is required. So we have been at pains to explain to them. But still, they have this lurking doubt in their mind that probably India will go close to US in, an, in, in, in its own uh, effort to contain China. That is why whenever you talk about Quad, whenever you talk about Indo-Pacific, they are actually very uncomfortable. They say that you know, Asia-Pacific is a better, better model and that is what we should go to. And Indo-Pacific and Quad are basically organizations created to contain, contain China. So therefore, you have an issue here that where they feel that whatever India is doing is going close to US more and more. And that is where your question came of Prime Minister Modi visiting US is actually, you know, being questioned by, by the Chinese in some forums. So this is the mindset that is working on the working in their minds to say that, you know, India is joining hands with the West to contain China. And that is the one which keeps telling them that, you know, we need to be careful of India. And that is also a certain belief that they've got. And because they've said it, it is right. So it's like a vicious circle for them. I agree. I mean, that uh, we have been at pains to explain to them. Look, please look at your history. <laughs> Two decades we have been slowly building up. We have been diversifying. We have not been depending on anybody. And, you know, even in Quad, even though a lot of people have started calling it Quad security dialogue, which is incor incorrect, actually speaking. It's a Quad, quad mechanism. It is not, it's not a security dialogue. A lot of analysts have started writing called Quad Security Dialogue now. India is the one which actually did not... Actually, if you look at those 13 subjects which Quad deals with, there are only two subjects which deal with security. One is maritime, the other one is cyber. Beyond that, we have not got into any kind of physical security issues. And you can see it. Our defense minister and others, the ex-defense -ex ministers and others, have been on record saying, that we will not join hands in doing corn ops in South China Sea, etc., etc. Still, there is a lurking doubt in the mind of the mind of the Chinese that you know India has probably joined hands with West to contain them. That is something. And even in Indo-Pacific and Quad, we have been insisting that this is not a security mechanism which are actually to contain China, but basically these are looking at regional development, regional cooperation, and things like that. So that is something I think again. We, we keep repeatedly telling them, but it's it keeps worrying them all the time. You know, this this tells me a lot, sir. You know, when I'm going to read the next time a Chinese writing, I'm going to be thinking of a whole different thing. And I hope the viewers also got what I what I got out of it because this is something which brings about the arrogance of the thought process, not arrogance of the people or anything like that. Is the arrogance of the thought process and the arrogance of the system of China. Uh, and very well explained, sir. Thank you so much. It's 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 a uh, it's something that you can't read anywhere. I have not seen people somebody explaining this particular concept of that mindset, which says I'm always right. Uh, you know, we we we've understood them to be pushy. We've understood them to be uh, aggressive. We've not understood them to be arrogant in terms of actually believing every word that they say to be the gospel truth. Thank you so much for bringing that out, sir. And it's, as I said, always a learning experience talking to you. Looking forward to talking to you once again in the near future. Till then, sir. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you very much.